I'm very pleased to, uh, to invite uh, Patrick Brown, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario here. We're going to switch the format up a little bit. Rather than have the leader uh, just give a speech, I think he's going to deliver a few comments and we'll uh, do a little bit of Q&A. Uh, I'm not sure how many people in, in the room uh, have met, uh, have met the leader, so we thought that might be a good format for you, Patrick. Um, many of you will know that, uh, that Patrick was elected as leader of the Progressive Conservative Party just this uh, past May, and he ran on a platform of party renewal, promising to grow his party uh, to over 100,000 members, and congratulations on your recent uh, election victory in, in Simcoe North. Um, so with that, Patrick, I'm going to invite you up. Well, these guys are changing the chairs on the Titanic here a little bit. You're mic'd, and... I'll sit over on this side. So welcome. It's nice to see you. Oh, thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. They're getting flowers. Are you, they're, gonna, they're probably going to show up with candles in a minute. Are you say, bringing yeah. us tea or coffee or any of that kind of they stuff? They can change the stage pretty quickly. Hey, <laughs> that's right. If we don't sit down, they may take our chairs away from us. <laughs> so welcome this morning. Uh, appreciate you bringing uh, bringing Vic uh, Fideli down with you. He's been a a great supporter and uh, help to the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and I saw Vic somewhere today. Just look for the guy in the yellow tie. He'll be somewhere yeah. there, right there. That's right, and, and he's, uh, Vic, you're the finance critic now? Well, welcome. Uh, the caucus has been a, a real big supporter of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and, and for that we're grateful, and we're glad to have you here today. So what we thought we'd do is give you an opportunity to, to talk a little bit about your vision, and where you're going, and then what I'd like to do is open it up to, to questions a little bit, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. So I thought it would be instructive today just to highlight where we are in Ontario today and where we need to go. Um, the challenges we face in Ontario today, obviously, in the last decade we've lost 350,000 manufacturing jobs. More recently, Standard & Poor's downgraded our credit. Uh, we're the most indebted subnational government in the world. You know, that's a big challenge for Ontario, and it's one thing uh, to say the government's making a mess of things, but I think what we, can, what we should really do as, as an opposition party is to highlight what, what's the path forward. Now, I think everyone recognizes the challenges Ontario faces and that we could be doing better. What is the path forward for prosperity? And for me, it relates back to a, a piece of advice I actually got in India. When I was a federal MP, uh, I was the chair of the Canada India uh, Parliamentary Association. I remember back in 2008 or 9, I was visiting a chief minister in Gujarat where they had a state that had struggled with some horrible earth earthquakes, but then they'd gone through an economic revival leading India in growth. And I remember asking the chief minister, I said, how did you turn your state around? And he said to me, you need good roads to get product to marketplace, you need affordable power, and you need to cut red tape. And then he showed me the, the roads in Gandhinagar, and they were, they were roads that were like North American style roads. And for India, that's impressive. Uh, and in red tape, you know, he gave me an example of how Tata was building a car company elsewhere in India with 50,000 jobs, and it was going to take them a year and a half in red tape. He called up the owner and said, you come to Gujarat, you'll have your approvals in three days. And he moved 50,000 jobs. And on affordable power, he built the most amazing dam with the Narmada dam on, on hydropower that was cheaper power than the rest of India. I thought to myself, how do we compare that to Ontario? If those are the fundamentals you need, how do we compare that to Ontario? In Ontario today, gridlock is suffocating um, you know, most urban hubs. We're missing important transportation links uh, in northern Ontario. I know the Chamber's done some great work on advocacy for the Ring of Fire. Uh, but transportation infrastructure is a challenge in Ontario. On red tape, we got more red tape than anywhere else in North America. We've got 350,000 regulations. You know, I think we should have an audit of government and see, you know, where is red tape killing business? In my by-election in Simcoe North, the mayor of Midland was telling me it took him two years to get a driveway permission from the province to build a driveway into an A&W. When I went up to the Ring of Fire with Vic Fideli, 
We met with a, a mining company there that said the terms of reference on an EA that was supposed to take 45 days took three years. No wonder the mining sector is in decline. You know, we need to make Ontario the easiest place to invest, and red tape is a barrier to that. And on energy, well, the Chamber knows about the challenge is energy. Your report in July, I thought, was excellent. We have among the highest energy prices in North America. We're never going to compete for new jobs unless we get this right. Uh, and the government's own report says the energy prices are going to rise another 42 percent between 2013 and 2018. And there's so many warning signs about how this is horrendous for business growth. You look at Napanee, uh, where um, the plant there, the, the, the Goodyear expansion, um, got canceled because of energy prices. You look at, at Extrata, you know, going to Quebec. When I sat down with Ontario Mining Association, I said, what are your, what's your biggest concern? They said energy prices. Frankly, every sector I go to, they talk about energy. You know, I was in Windsor a few weeks ago, and the mayor of Windsor, Drew Dilkin, said he went after the new Land Rover and Volvo plants, and he said their application technically was superior to everyone else pitching for those jobs. And he lost, but he said he lost because of provincial politics. He lost because of energy prices, and he lost because of the potential payroll tax. And let me add that in. The, you know, we have to get our fundamentals right on roads, on energy, on red tape, but we have to avoid at all costs any, anything additional, anything that would give people reasons not to pick Ontario. And I'm really glad the Chamber has taken such a leadership role on opposing this payroll tax. You get it. You know, the fact that 57 Chambers wrote a joint letter to the government saying this is a worrisome sign for business, you get it. You know, when the Fiat Chrysler CEO was in, was in Toronto in June and asked why Chrysler wasn't making investments in Ontario, he said there was a cost to Ontario policies. And he specifically referenced ORPP, and he referenced energy. And so my goal is this. You know, if I had the honor in two years and eight months to be Premier of Ontario, not that, I'm, not, not that we're counting for the next election, um, my goal would be to do this. Make, make the way we look at governance in Ontario, how can we make Ontario the easiest place to invest? How can we make Ontario the easiest place to grow a business? Because when a business is looking at Ontario, they're also looking and Manitoba, Quebec, Michigan, New York. This is a global competition for investment and for jobs, and we have to be slightly better than our competitors. And right now, unfortunately, we're not slightly better. The conditions on roads, on red tape, on energy, on new potential um, government initiatives like the, like the payroll tax, we are slightly or significantly worse. And so we need to change that. When a Drew Dilkins of Windsor wants to make a pitch, I want to give him the cards to win that pitch. So that's that's my uh, proposal in a, in, a summary, in, a, in, a, in a quick summary. Okay. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. There are challenges, without question. You've identified uh, infrastructure, and, and I think uh, all parties uh, agree on the infrastructure piece. Energy is very controversial, and, and, and as I uh, uh, have occasion to travel around the province, I hear that as well. But the practical reality is, what can you actually do about energy prices? It's not any one party that, uh, that has introduced policies that have led to where we are. Um, I suppose we could argue yeah. about that, but we're not here to argue. We're really focused on solution. Right. What actually can we do uh, to curb the rising cost of uh, input, uh, primarily uh, electricity prices? Well, well there, there's some things we can't change. One, we can't change um, the gas plant scandal, which went on our energy bills. Uh, we can't change the smart meter scandal that went on our energy bills. Um, I would say this, though. Um, what we can change, you know, under the Green Energy Act, um, it's created a situation where we have a massive surplus. So this year, we've given away a billion dollars. A billion dollars this year alone. Um, you know, that's certainly the notion that we'd be giving out uh, contracts, renewable contracts that aren't competitive with what the renewable contracts are in other jurisdictions is certainly a, a cause for the energy prices. It, it's one of many causes. Um, certainly, the, 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 there's no easy solution here, but you know, a few months ago, uh, Ontario gave out wind energy contracts the same week Quebec did. But we gave out double that we were paying 13 cents and they were paying six cents. Um, 
he, he, the contracts we were giving out were not consistent with what uh, other jurisdictions were paying for, for green energy anywhere else in the world. We haven't talked about um, health or education. So nearly half of the provincial budget uh, is taken up by health. And uh, uh, the second most significant uh, component is, is education. So we've heard a lot today about uh, skills and training and key talent. What are your thoughts on both of those two areas, which represent some 70 plus percent of, uh, of government spending? Well, the conversation I love to have on education in Ontario is this. How do you link education to employment? We don't pay any consideration to that right now. I'll give you an example. Last year, we graduated 9,000 teachers for 5,000 teaching positions. Um, my mother is a teacher. I've got, I've got an aunt who's a teacher. I, I, everyone has a loved one um, who, who is a teacher that, in many cases, if they're, if they're young, they can't find a job. It's not fair to see a young person go through school, have a student debt, have, this, have the, the, the province subsidize that diploma, and then for it not to be used. The notion that we do this in a number of fields makes no sense. And why it makes no sense is there are jobs out there. You know, uh, uh, Vic is uh, the proudest northerner you can get. And I was telling Vic, I was at Cambrian College um, in Sudbury visiting the Power Line program. Uh, they told me they had 24 graduates last year, 300 plus job offers. In, in some areas, in Germany and in the Nordic countries, they streamline education to employment. They take in consideration what the job market is. Where do you want to train people for the skills that exist today? You know, I find it incredible that we don't do that in Ontario today. Um, so that's a conversation we have to have on education. On healthcare, you know, right now we're throwing the the kitchen sink uh, and everything inside the hospital. And inside hospital care is the most expensive. Um, I think we need to look at what we can do more outside of the, the hospital. The government has cut those sides of the healthcare budget. So you, you saw physiotherapy in seniors' residences removed. So the $50 million uh, cut two years ago has now resulted in 30% more falls. So you have seniors going to the hospital and it ends up costing the government more. You look at the long-term care beds, we have a huge long-term care bed shortage, uh, and uh, Vic will know the exact figure, but it's three or four times the price for a hospital bed than it is a long-term care bed. You underfund, you underfund um, care outside the hospital, you end up paying inside the hospital. Another example like that would be uh, you know, mental health. We underfund mental health in Ontario, and we pay more be because of that underfunding. And so what I'd love to do is have a an overall look at healthcare and say, you know, what could we do on long-term care, on home care, on preventative health care um, that would alleviate some of the pressures on the most expensive points of contact in the healthcare system? We've heard a lot um, last night and today about startups uh, trying to scale small to medium-sized uh, business, and I'm I'm reminded of the uh, of differentiating Bilal between uh, small to medium size and startups. Where is your your thinking and, and that of your caucus on how do we create 21st century companies? How is Canada going to compete in this world in which we are, from time to time I say, a relative rounding error? We don't expect to see too many really large new companies coming into Ontario, we need to create them. Mm -hmm. How can we go about doing that? How do we create an environment where there's a, a degree of collaboration between government and, and business and academia that, that creates a culture where people can, can take some risk? It strikes that we're so busy eating our young and tearing each other down that nobody wants to take any risk. How do you change the environment and the culture that would enable people to take some risk and, uh, and create new companies? Well, you know, I, I, I think that's one of the most exciting opportunities that exists in Ontario. Because you're right, traditional jobs uh, may not be the ones available in the years ahead. Uh, in the innovation sector, uh, there is a growing market. Um, and so I think government needs to encourage that. The government needs to be an incubator uh, to that. Um, and sometimes it means that traditional government programs, you can't use a, a cookie cutter solution. You need to be uh, flexible. You know, I, uh, I think when I was an MP in Barrie, um, there was uh, 
uh, IBM. They wanted to do um, a major plant in Barrie, but they wanted an academic partner, and the academic partner couldn't do it without government. So, you know, we did a, a $20 million investment, but it netted a $250 million project. Mm. And uh, those were high-tech jobs, and that's different because it's not a startup. It, it's a it's a large business, but I, I think we need to go to those who are on the front lines of innovation and say, what advantages can we give you to be in Ontario? If, if, if a, a young innovator you know, was building an, a, an app or a great idea, and he has a choice to do it in San Francisco or Toronto or Niagara Falls, what could we do? And, and I think the best people to have that conversation with are those that are struggling to come up with that next great idea. Well, that's great. I don't know whether we have time, Marina, for a question or two. No, I'm getting the uh, Nick say. Um, no question. So just reflecting on the agenda that, that we have uh, for the remaining part of today and tomorrow morning, and we'll have the Premier and, and, and Cabinet and, and some other folks down, the Governor of, of uh, Michigan's coming around to see us. Any parting uh, words that you want to leave with the audience in terms of what we need to do collectively to help accelerate growth in Ontario? Well, uh, I think the government of Michigan has been recruiting jobs in Ontario, and yeah. a starting point, we want, to, we want to make sure that doesn't continue. Um, but I, uh, I think it's about getting our fundamentals right. And so, you know, I think the conversation you should have with the Premier and Cabinet is, how can we get our fundamentals right? What commitment do they have to get our fundamentals right on red tape, on, on roads, getting product to marketplace, um, and on energy? And, uh, and hopefully they can heed some of the advice, some of the reports that the, uh, the, the chamber has written because I thought, I really believe the chamber, whether it's on energy or whether it's on the, the payroll tax, uh, you've been a leader on this discussion in Ontario and certainly as a progressive conservative caucus, we, we greatly appreciate that. Good. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your public service and, and the work that you're doing. Uh, with that, uh, round of applause for, uh, for Patrick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick.